Hello to all our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Today we're going to be discussing complying with geographically specific maritime environmental rules connecting teams shoreside and on board with our guest speakers from One Ocean, product specialist Per Usterberg and deputy CTO and director of product delivery, Tony Brown. If you have any questions, leave them at the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And here's our host, founding editor of Digital Ship, Carl Jeffrey. Well, thanks. So what we're going to talk about today is supporting compliance with geographically specific maritime environmental rules. So that's quite a mouthful, but can say it more simply. Different rules apply in different parts of the sea and you need to know what rules to follow. So a big part of that is water discharge. So that's discharge from scrubbers, incinerators, grey water, sewage. There's different rules in different places. There's also different logbook entries you have to make. There's also different emission rules in different parts of the ocean. You need to know what rules apply when you're planning the voyages and when you're on board the ship and when you're auditing afterwards. So we're going to hear about an approach to use digital technology to do that. So perhaps the most important thing, you've got to give good situation awareness to crew and the shoreside staff. And so they know exactly what rules they need to follow, which rather than have lots of different information sources, it's, it's good if they just have one thing they have to look at. There's also new regulations coming in they need to know about. They've got to plan the voyage in advance and know what rules they've got to apply. And they've got to keep up to date with changes. So we're going to have two speakers today. We've got Per Oosterberg, who's an environmental product specialist with One Ocean. He's based in Stockholm. And we've got Tony Brown, who's global head of products with One Ocean, based in North London. If you don't know One Ocean Group, you might know Chart Co. a bit better, or Marine Press of Canada. These two companies merged in 2019. And uh, we're going to see for the first time today software which shows the environmental rules which apply on a map so you can plan the voyage and see it very visually what you have to do. We're going to have a presentation for about 30 minutes and there should be plenty of time for questions and answers so please load your questions in the Q&A box at any time and we'll take them at the end so I'd like to invite Per to give the opening talk thanks. Thank you very much Carl so I will start with sharing my screen so that, that was the introduction. I will not try to, to say that again, but um, I will make a short presentation of myself. So Per Östberg, um, broadcasting from Sweden, Stockholm today. I, I am a software guy um, entering the maritime industry uh, by launching a new high-speed navigation system in 2006. And I was the former CEO of the company that invented the product that we're gonna look at today called the Mara Manager. And Tony? Yeah, thanks, Per. Good morning, everyone. Um, as the bio says, I've been with One Ocean Group for quite some time. Um, my role and mission here is to bring digital transformation and digital solutions to the industry, um, working very closely with our clients and partners just you know, enhance those products so both the ship side users and shore side management teams can optimize their day-to-day -day activities. So that's the, the main ambition from myself. Thank you, Per. Thank you, Tony. And uh, the agenda for today, a very short introduction to One Ocean, and then we're gonna speak a little bit about environmental regulations. And uh, what is MR Manager? That is the product we're gonna demonstrate. We're gonna show you what it, what it is. I don't know if you heard of this product before. Maybe we could ask the audience a question. Do you have a poll for me on that, Farah? We certainly do. Just hold on. And have you heard of the service Enviro Manager before? Yes or no? Answers are still coming in. Interesting, the product I've been working with 10 years. So, so I think everyone knows about it, but it's usually <laughs> not the case. <laughs> okay, and um, would you like to share the results with the rest of the audience? Sir? Yes, please, please do. And this is what we have at the moment. Oh, very so, good, I'm, I'm 27%. happy. 27%. Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. 
So, so um, that's very good. Uh, so it's going to be a completely new product for for seventy five percent of you, and and you're going to see some news there, uh, in this product that we haven't shown on the market before. We're going to speak about uh, voyage planning and environmental regulations for all the steps in the voyage plan, and uh, how we can support also situation awareness from the ship and shore side, and uh, then we will uh, take the questions at the end. So Tony, you, you've been working in One Ocean much longer than me. Maybe you should take this slide and tell a little, little bit about One Ocean. Sure thing, Per. Thank you. So for those that don't know, One Ocean um, was born around two years ago from the merger of Chartco and Marine Press of Canada. Um, before that, these two companies are very well known providers of digital solutions to the, the maritime market, you know, navigational solutions and compliance solutions. And we've now merged, as I said, in uh, 2019 to become One Ocean. So today, One Ocean is offering you know, a large range of navigation compliance solutions, um, removing the boundaries that exist between ship and shore, making you know, data transparent, um, helping customers benefit from much more efficient and cleaner and safer practices. The One Ocean platform itself, and you're going to see lots of it today, um, provides all of the tools oh. needed one simple centralized platform um, from fleet management solutions to navigation and compliance solutions on board the ship, operational reporting and meeting safety obligations. Um, as a global presence, we have offices everywhere you would expect them to be. Um, we have over 300 experts supporting our customers um, on a day to day basis, 24 seven across the world, follow the sun um, support kind of methodology. In terms of software um, users, we have over 15,000 vessels taking uh, more than six services from us. So absolutely fantastic. And those 15,000 users are um, representing 2,600 plus um, companies globally. Thank you, Tony. Maybe you should tell us a little bit about the different services as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. Now, the, the portfolio, portfolio that One Ocean are offering is you can almost kind of divide it into four, four slices. Um, the first part is very focused on passage planning. So providing solutions to allow the, the officers on board to efficiently plan and optimize um, their passage plans in advance, but also monitor those passage plans in real time to make you know, informed decisions based on the latest information that's being received. So it's not just about the appraisal and planning stage, it's also we've moved into the execution and monitoring phase of the passage planning process. Um, in terms of uh, the next part, um, extensive compliance solutions, um, providing solutions to the vessels themselves across fleets of ships and at the shoreside operational centers. Um, we also have a safety section focusing on safety and quality procedures, you know, reducing the risk, providing audit trails. And last but not least is what we're focusing on today is environmental. So latest regulatory information, which helps minimize, you know, environmental impact, reduces risk, reduces the risk of fines from different nations, coast guards and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure Pear, you're gonna talk about that throughout the presentation. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's uh, one of the most interesting services we are, we are having on the market. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. So looking a little bit about the environmental regulation and really what, what, what is the challenge for the whole shipping industry today? I think it consists of a couple of things. One is that new environmental regulations are coming into force rapidly and existing regulations are changing uh, with a short notice uh, as well. And th that makes it difficult to be on top of the information that you need to be on top of at all the time. Another thing uh, that I'm usually speak about is that the baseline is misunderstood or unknown on board. And, and the reason for that is that you don't have the baseline in your ecosystem. It's not there in the ENC. And the reason why it's important to know uh, the distance to the baseline is because when Marpool is speaking about discharges, they always mention that you must be on a certain distance from nearest land. And nearest land, that, that is not, not the coastline, that is the distance to the baseline. 
So usually I take this as an example. And, and <clears throat> when I'm asking captains about a line or a route or trace like this, wh where can you discharge food waste if you look at this map? And, and in 95% of the cases, the answer is that, well, it's, it's forbidden here because it's, it's too close to the land. But up here, I mean, you're, you're on a safe distance. You're actually 30, 40 nautical miles from, from the, the shoreline and, and down here all the way. So forbidden here, allowed there and allowed there. So what we have done with the environment is that we have created the baseline. We have the baseline for the whole world. And by having that, we can easily show you an environmental map here. And here you can actually see that it's almost the opposite, that the only place where you are allowed to discharge food waste in this case, it's down here. And then it's forbidden everywhere else. So the question is, how often is, is a faulty discharge happening? Just about food waste, I, I actually was making a test with, with the Hamburger police a couple of years ago. And we was looking at the record books for 300 vessels and uh, looking at the discharge of food waste. And we could see that in 25% of the cases, the records showed that it was a faulty discharge. So it's happened quite often. And I, I would say the more Marpol regulation has come out to the market, the more difficult it has been to follow the environmental regulations. So what, what is really the problem when it comes to, to, to understand the regulation on place? Yeah, it is that the regulation text is difficult. And if you go to an opposition like this, what, what do you have to go through? What is the process that you have to go through to find the regulations for a given position where your vessel are right now? So let us look at that. First, you must find out how far away from the baseline is this position. And how do you do that? You don't have the baseline available on board the ship. So you, you, usually what is happening in that is you're measuring to the coastline, you're taking a safety margin, and you think you are on a safe distance. What are the international rules for this position? Yeah, international rules must always be followed. And the next is, is there any special area, particularly sensitive sea areas? Ek areas, national marine sanctuary, non-discharge zones for this position? Or is there any national rules that you have to take in consideration? Outside the US coast, you have the vessel's general permit. Or is there any more local directives? Again, outside the US coast, you have different regulations from state to state. So environment management that we are built up, it simplified the information to really make it easy for your crew to know what and when a correct discharge can be made. And it's built like, an, an, like a position-based information system. And I was thinking about also, uh, how, how do you communicate regulation to your ship if, if they are mentioned uh, from different countries? So I was looking at, at uh, how regulation was communicated from, from Korea, for example, about the new vessel speed reduction program. It's, it's a PDF format. And what you can do is, of course, to send this out to the ship and hope that the crew will have it in place when they are reaching this area. And I saw ek areas. There, I mean, there's a lot to read here, several pages. There's a small map at the end. You have all the, the different um, positions, the map where their regulations are entered into force for each. And again, you can send this PDF out as well. And there's, of course, other type of information. I know that th this was something that was creating a lot of problems to the market when Malaysia was enforcing and looking at, at anchoring. This has nothing to do with environmental regulation, but I know that this is typically an example where you have to follow certain regulation and certain position. Let me now show uh, environment manager um, at... Um, demo that I just made for you. Let me see. I should open that one up. <clears throat> Here it comes. So here we are. 
this is how the product, how the software work. And, and before I start playing this, what you can see here is a ship on this can't see screen share at the moment. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I can. Yep, that's right. Okay, very good. So this, this is the software environment. We have this environmental map. This different stage of blue is showing the distance to the nearest land. We are bringing in the GPS position. It, and you can see here on the left-hand side, the different regulations that you have. The bilge water, air emissions, sewage and grave water, cargo, garbage and food waste and ballast. And it's changing depending on the ship's position. So you will just have the information just at time uh, for the certain GPS uh, uh, feed here. And of course, uh, we are working with the, like a traffic light system here. When it's red, it's forbidden. And when it's changing, when you're coming further out from the coast, when things are getting allowed, uh, it will change from red to green. And when it's green, it means that it's allowed. If we look at bilge water here right now, I think we're going to have a small opening up here. And we will see that it will go from red to green in just a moment. Let me move this a bit forward. Okay, and here what you would like can do also outside the coast, you can double click and then you will get more detailed information outside here. We can see up here that we are within the National Marine Sanctuary for Monterey Bay, outside of California, outside the United States, and we are within an neck area. So you have all the information available in one place. I shall move this a little bit forward and you will see, for example, that's where I'm broadcasting from in Sweden. We can see here right now that we are allowed to discharge bilge water in, in the Swedish head of water. I select location, then I can move the cursor to any country. When I move it to, to Den, Danish water, we get the regulation for the Danish water. So this is the system showing you just the information you need to know telling you what you can and cannot do on a certain position. And this is the product that, that we are looking at. This is actually the product that um, we uh, launched three, three years ago. So I would like to show, start to show you this because looking at all these environmental zones that we're having here, and then looking what happened in the last three years, you know that there's been a lot of new regulations about um, uh, open loop scrubber, closed loop scrubber. There's coming up new environmental zones at all time that you have to follow. And let us move over to how the product looks today. And you can see that it's much, much more small zones and regulations everywhere. We have been more than added more than 500 environmental zones in the last three years. Imagine that you should have a PDF on board for every zone to know the regulations. And here on the left-hand side, you can also see that there's a lot of more waste streams. We have divided them up into different, uh, uh, in different areas. So here you have a greater overview of, of the United States and you can see all the different waste streams at this area. And of course, in the same way, uh, we have added information that can go to on the route on our way from um, South Korea to Singapore. Here we can see that we are having a special surfer regulation. This is what you needed to know from the PDF, it shows you that your maximum sulfur content is 10%. And it also shows you the information that you need about the speed reduction areas. And also what we are having here is of course, uh, we have the regulator source. We have the source document here as well. So you, do, you always have everything at the same place. So if I'm clicking on the, this regulation source, we will see how this document will come up that I showed in the PDF format. It's here, it's available, everything you need to know. You don't have to worry about that the PDF is not there, that they remember to open the, the email about this.
Okay, and uh, I shall. When it comes to voyage planning environmental regulations, there's of course a lot of uh, different areas that, that you have to take care of during the whole voyage. And we could see that um, there is international regulations and there is also national regulation. The question is here, what is, will come in the future? Will it be more difficult to follow national regulations or international regulation? I think we have a poll for that as well, Farah. We certainly do. So, over the next three years, will national or international regulations be the biggest challenge for your organisation? And we have a choice of international, national, I don't know, or not applicable. And the answers are coming in. Still coming in. It's going to be interesting because, um, yeah, sometimes there is new national regulation that is very difficult. We, we know that France will, will ban the use of open loop scrubber in, in their territorial water in the beginning of next year. But there is also international regulations that are coming up that is difficult. So, so interesting to see your view on this. So we've just managed to get the answers finalized. And we're just switching to the poll right now, sharing results. And these are the results. Very so interesting. Answers are international, 53%, national, 28%. I don't know, 12%, and not applicable, 7%. Thank you so much, Farah. And uh, Tony, I think you're going to show us some additional new features. Uh, that is supporting Sorry. also the planning, execution and monitoring part of the voyage. Yeah, if you can um, just take off your screen sharing pair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Can we confirm you can see my screen pair? Yes, I can yep. see your screen, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Pear, for, for that interesting um, insight into in environmental rules and regulations. What I plan to do now is just share with you how this is incorporated into the voyage planning process um, and how our platform can help um, provide some of the answers to the problems that Pear has um, outlined. So what we're seeing here is the One Ocean platform. This is the software that sits on board the ship. Um, as you can see, there's many modules that um, we can provide services for, but what we're focusing on today is the voyage planning area and the environment manager area of, of the platform. Um, so what I've done, I've done a short video. Um, the, the concept of this is we're planning a voyage from uh, Seattle down to Long Beach in California. And what I'm gonna show you is how the, how the officers and engineers on board can use the platform um, for the appraisal stage of the voyage planning process, um, for then uh, the planning part of the process, and then how it can be utilized during execution and monitoring. Um, for those that have One Ocean already installed on, on your vessels, there's some really interesting new features that are now part of the platform that we released around two weeks ago. So there's some really great new um, information to be shared here. So I'm going to play off this um, this video. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, click into the Environment Manager module. And Pear has touched on this, but as we can see, my vessel position is currently off, off Seattle. But as an officer, as an engineer, I want to understand some of the restrictions in Long Beach. I simply go into location mode. I drop my pin within the port limits of Long Beach. Um, I want to understand the open loop EGCS restrictions. I click on the tile. It tells me it's prohibited within 24 nautical miles of California baseline. I then click on the regulatory source and it gives me the marine notice that's been issued by the California Air Resources Board. So from an appraisal perspective, the tool is very useful for um, dropping the pin and understanding the rules that are going to be you know, coming up later in the voyage. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to plan a route from Seattle down to Long Beach. You can see my ship is currently sitting alongside the, the berth in, in the port of Seattle. 
I'm choosing to depart Seattle at uh, midnight on the 1st of December and we're UTC minus eight hours and we're coming down to Long Beach. So what the system has done, it's now plotted the route down, down the coast, um, coming out of Long Beach here, sorry, coming out of Seattle here. You can see the, uh, the route is um, making a turn through this National Marine area and then it's taking me down the coast, down into California. From a, a planning perspective, I'm not currently quite comfortable with these waypoints here. They're too close to um, the, the, the baseline. So what you can do, you can drag the waypoint um, to the west, drop the waypoint to start, you know, create a route that's avoiding these national areas, avoiding um, being within three nautical miles of the baseline or 12 nautical miles of the baseline. The rules are not as um, restrictive and it allows me to, you know, potentially make some uh, some bilge water discharge or I can operate my scrubbers and so on. So down here, I'm avoiding this um, speed reduction area as well. I'm just dragging the waypoints a bit further south to avoid, you know, I can't avoid coming into this speed reduction area, but I can avoid going through this National Marine Sanctuary. So I've just removed moved the waypoints down further south. Of course, it's not as simple as that in the real world. We know we have, um, you know, we have to understand that we have enough charted depth under the vessel's kill. Um, as a passage planning solution, we do have um, ENC charts that can be uh, monitored in the system as well. And we have underkill clearance calculations. So now that we've created the route that we're comfortable with, it's avoiding these environmental areas that we didn't want to, um, to enter. We now build a digital passage plan document. The passage plan document that, that One Ocean builds is, is built automatically by the system. It meets all of the um, requirements of IMO, UKHO, OCIMF. So we're adhering to all of the passage planning guidelines by these bodies. And we have a very comprehensive digital passage plan solution. This new version requires the sign off process to be done digitally. So every user on board will have a, a username and a password. The, the second officer or navigating officer will prepare the plan, put it forward for approval. The second officer will um, then ask for the chief officer to sign it off as a second licensed officer. And then the captain will sign it off. Once the captain has signed off the, the passage plan, the plan no longer is a draft. It becomes the formalized version of the passage plan. An interesting new feature that we've introduced is the introduction of a series of schedules. So imagine currently the officers on board or the engineers on board, they may be producing these schedules in Excel or something like this. Um, what the system is now automatically providing our customer and our user base is a automatically generated environmental schedule for each day of the voyage. So for day one, I get a very, smart looking schedule that's automatically generated for me. It tells me I'm departing Seattle at midnight. I'm, for the whole of day one, I'm inside this emission control area. I'm gonna be sailing through at least two national marine sanctuaries. I'm always inside the Pacific regional area. And between 0345 and 0600, I'm gonna be within a whaling area. And there's a 10 knot speed restriction. The system is also automatically telling me for all of the, um, the waste streams that I've selected for this vessel, it's telling me what I can and cannot do. So these green areas are telling me it's, it's permitted, it's allowed to make a discharge. So for example, bilge water. Bilge water is prohibited for discharge until 0645 hours. And that's indicated by these red blocks. There's 15 minute intervals every hour. This is a 24 hour schedule. And thereafter, the discharge of bilge water is allowed for the rest of day one. Then that carries on. So we have a, the same schedule for day two and day three of the voyage. These can be printed out and um, pinned on, on boards around the ship, in the ship's office, in the engine room. Um, the beauty of this is if the passage plan is changed for any reason, the departure is delayed, by an hour, two hours, three hours, it's not a problem. All we do is we simply regenerate the passage plan with the new departure time. 
And this schedule is automatically updated with the new departure time and therefore will therefore show all of the latest um, uh, regulations for the new departure time. So that's the first new feature of this version we released two weeks ago. Very powerful, very um, you know, time saving, providing you know, more efficiency on board the vessel. Okay, the second part of the story is imagine you have a 14 day itinerary. You're a container ship or um, you're on a, some kind of um, fixed itinerary. You know your port rotation for the next 14 days. What we can now do in One Ocean is we can build you a voyage portfolio. Again, a very brand new feature that's just been launched. Um, we click on here, this example. This is a 14 day, sorry, 11 day schedule from Southampton to Cadiz, to Barcelona, to Livorno. It's a Mediterranean itinerary. The system is automatically generating this information for the, for the, for the vessel. All of the data that you see on the table is automatically generated. It's calculated in the distances, the departure times, arrival times, times in port, the average speed, the, uh, the time zone, distance to go, and so on which is great, but what it also gives me is an environmental schedule for the full 11 days. So 11 days ahead of arriving in Gibraltar, I know what restrictions are gonna be in force for Gibraltar. So I can scroll down to each day of the schedule. And as an example here, I think it's on day five, I'm gonna be arriving in Barcelona and I can see five days ahead of time, what the restrictions are in Barcelona, what is allowed, what's not allowed, what is allowed with restrictions and so on. So you get the idea. Absolutely fantastic new feature that have been introduced into the platform. Okay, final part of the story is the execution and monitoring stage. So what we're planning to do now is we're gonna use this passage plan that we've created from Seattle to Long Beach and we're gonna make it the active passage plan in the system. Now that we've made it active, you get this really nice timeline along the top. You can zoom in and out of this and it gives you all of the information on the waypoints between Seattle and Long Beach. The, the passage plan is loaded on the chart. So it's always seen in every module. You have access along the tabs here to the active passage plan, the active waypoints. And again, a brand new feature that no one has seen yet. Um, an active environmental timeline. So this is bringing in the input from AIS or GPS. It's interrogating the system. It's understanding your distance from the baseline. It's understanding what areas you're gonna be sailing through. It understands what rules are gonna be in force um, for this voyage. And it gives you this very visual timeline of events for the next 12 hours. So it's a 12 hour look ahead, a two hour look behind, but based on the real life situation of the ship. So it's providing live situational awareness of all of the environmental regulations that are in force for this voyage. The plan is, the schedule that I showed you earlier is perfect for planning purposes. And it's, it's assuming that you're departing on time and the schedule is based on your planned departure time. But we know in the real world, the ship may not leave port on time. They then may speed up to catch up with the time which means they're sailing faster than the plan that they, you know, they, uh, the, the passage plan that they planned earlier. And the real situation may be a bit different from the passage plan. So this live mode gives you a real life situational awareness of what's going on. You can see here, I'm actually 18 minutes behind the plan, but that doesn't concern me because I've got real life situational awareness of what's going on here. So just to finish off, um, what you can also do is you, when you move to the Environment Manager module and you turn on the timeline and you want to interrogate some of this data, for example, bilge water, it's red. I want to understand why. I can have the timeline here with all of the tiles on the left-hand side. And I can then click on bilge water and understand what's going on. Pear will come onto it in a moment, but what we can also do is introduce company policies into the system. So these are sh the strictest rules that can be applied in the system. 
it could be that there's a company policy to prohibit bilge water discharge uh, within 12 nautical miles of the baseline. We then add that into the database. That rule is applied globally um, where it's the most strictest. If there are stricter rules, obviously the stricter rules will apply. And this is then reflected in the timeline and all of the schedules that the system produces. Thanks a lot, Tony. Re really amazing. And I know that Port State Control Officer are starting to ask the question more frequently about how are you taking environmental regulation in consideration for your next route? Um, I, I mean, uh, just imagine how long time it will take to answer that question. But here you yeah. can just sh show the, this. Uh, the schedule answers all the schedule. questions. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. there. It's there in front of them. Right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen pair and pass the microphone back to you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, watching that. Yes, let's see if I'm uh, able to share my screen again. Or do you see it, Tony? Yep, yes, just like clear pair. Very, very good. I, I mean, they, they're been working with this product and, and uh, it's been popular in the market because it's really fulfilling a demand. Uh, we have it on more than 2,500 ships, and I think we are stalling environments on more than 100 ships every month, actually, right now. But we are running into a special for large organization that they are having a company specific requirement, that, like the company policy. For example, they could have a company po policy saying that you should not use the oil water separator anywhere in the world. Um, that that uh, is, is something, and we are showing the regulations. So it's, it's a mismatch there, you can say. And another thing could be that they would like to add a certain area, uh, speaking with this geography around Malaysia, for example, it has nothing to do with environmental regulation, but it's like a position-based information that they would like to give to the vessel. Or it could be that they would like to have a, a reminder about the manning level on the bridge. And they say, what, what, can't you use environment for this? And of course, they can. <laughs> so let, let me see if I can switch over to, to this video now. This is um, fleet mansion. I will not speak very much about the fleet mansion, all the different layers we have, but one layer that I think is interesting is of course the environmental layer. It's here, this is the product that you have from the shore side. And you, you, you can go in for every vessel and see the situation just around that vessel, see what kind of environmental regulations there is around this vessel. And you can see we have all the zones and everything here and all the waste streams for the vessels around here. So what you can do, let, let me go now in, into one uh, area. We can zoom into this. This is the uh, company that has created a company policy around Malaysia. And here you see exactly the zone where, where they were having this. And here we can see also the regulation presented for this. So this is what they can create from the shore side. And then from the shore side, they publish this to the vessels. You're just logging in to our web uh, authoring tool, our own production tools that we are using. And then you can communicate the information that you have created to, to your fleet. So th this is a very popular feature, of course, because you are getting your own position-based information system. You can communicate any information for any positions in the world. And that's very much what shipping are about. You should do a certain thing on a certain position and you need to know certain information on a certain uh, position. So I think this is a nice feature. And of course, one of the success behind this product is our regulation database. We've been having, uh, I think we have 10 people been, been adding and being on top of this regulation database been working with this for the last three years, just adding more and more information. It's a huge value for the market, but we can't take the whole market. So what we are looking at right now is also to provide access to this regulation database through APIs. So thank you very much for listening to, to, to me and Tony, and I hope we're having some questions that we can take, Carl. Oh, thank you. Okay, so now we're moving into the Q&A part of the uh, session. So if you want to put any questions in the Q&A box, I've got a few to start off with and uh, hopefully uh, there'll be some more questions coming in. Um, just the first question, this term baseline per, I've never heard it before. Is it, do you want to explain what, 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 what that means? Is it something every country makes itself or is it just a... Uh, 
Uh, no, no, that, that, that is uh, in, in United Nations, there is something called the UNCLOS, uh, United Nations Law at the Sea, and that is a, 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 a how you are defining the territorial water of a country. If you're taking a line for the uttermost small islands alongside a coastline, that is the start of the territorial water, and it reaches out additional 12 nautical miles. And I think, um, yeah. 98% of all the, the nations in the world has accepted that definition of a baseline. So th this is something that is defined. And it's not on EGDIS charts, ENCs, is it? No, no, it, it is not actually. But I mean, if, if you look at the paper charts and the, and, and the, the special day overview charts, that's where we have the baseline. But unfortunately, not many are doing that. And also the detail level is actually too bad trying to figure out where you are on the vessel in the charts today. So it's so really important. This, this, yeah. yeah, I think this is the reason why we see so many faulty discharges happening, actually, that you are not aware of the distance to nearest land. Yeah, it's like, sounds like really important information that you can't actually get hold of on a ship. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, when we started to develop this product, I, I can tell you that if we knew how much work it was to contact every nation, every hydrographic office in the whole world and get this data, and it was usually in text format, you had to read and getting the coordinate in text format. So to digitalize this took a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, the thing that struck me watching this, so I mean, the, the text instructions are so hard to read, you know, you've got people who don't have English as a first language and Showing on a map is so much easier, isn't it? And you it seems like yeah. so obvious. You think every shipping company should have it, really. <laughs> That's what I've seen, isn't it? I think so, too. Wow. Well, and it's all cloud-based, I guess. So you're able to update when new rules come in and if people spot errors or anything like that. That's a, I, I that. think uh, from from the ship side, Tony, this is more taken, but it's looking every six hours on the server if there is some any updates to be downloaded. Yeah, that's right, Pear. So yeah, one ocean platform on the ship is connected every six hours looking for new updates. Um, as Pear said, we've got a, a wide team um, constantly updating the database. So if a country decided to publish some new national rules tomorrow, we can quickly deploy that to the ship before that comes into force the next day. So, yeah. Oh, okay, so we've got a few questions come in. Damo Darren Kutungul, I've just looked up his LinkedIn page. I think he's with a engineering superintendent with Glencore in uh, London. So he's asking how you pay for this, one-time fee or initial fee followed by annual fees. Is that for Tony to answer? Uh, I'll pass that one to Pear, actually. Okay. Or on that side of the business. Uh, no, no, yes. No, it, it's an annual fee. In, and in that annual fee, it's including uh, all the regulations update. And I mean, it, it, it's quite a low price, I, I must say, to be on top of this. I think we are charging around 160 US, 160 US dollar per month to get all, all these environmental regulations on board your ship. Okay, and then John Hayflinger, so LinkedIn says he's Senior Vice President, Maritime Policy and Analysis at Carnival Corporation in Miami. He's asking about the, uh, the guarantees you're going to... Is that an easy question to answer? Do you think? Uh, absolutely. John, uh, we met before. Nice to, to hear from you. And, and uh, this question, the guarantee that we are giving on, on this, we were looking in actually to, to uh, get an insurance for this. That, uh, I mean, if you're following the product, it's important that the product is showing the right information. However, uh, to get an insurance for that, the product would be um, much, much more expensive. So, so we are having the same kind of uh, disclaimer as you have in your navigation systems. We give you the same guarantee as Ectis is giving when it comes to, to be able to avoid uh, um, shallow water, for example. That's quite a high level of guarantee for ENCs, isn't it? Well, well actually, it's not a high level of, of guarantee, but we can say that I've been working with this product for more than 10 years, and, and for the product that's been on the market for the last 10 years, and when customers have been using it, I can say that the baseline, it's of course important that the baseline is correct, but the, the design philosophy when we are creating the baseline, if there is some um, questions about baseline position, we are always on the safe side. We are make, maybe give you an extra margin. So it could be that our product is telling you that it's forbidden, but it's actually allowed. 
And by having a design philosophy by, that are supporting better safe than sorry, then we are making sure that the customer can follow this product without risking any penalties. Yeah, um, and you're also tracking back to the PDFs coming directly from the government departments, aren't you? So I guess if there's any errors, people can probably spot them quite quickly and correct them because it's cloud-based, I suppose. So. Yes, that's yes, correct. Yeah, oh, and um, that's for interesting. And then on the integration, I guess what people would really like is integrating this with the Ectis to move the roots over, but you can't integrate with Ectis very easily, <coughs> can you? I don't think this Well, Well, no, and, and I... I see an example of, of um, uh, companies and organizations that are actually adding on ECDIS the environmental regulations at the top level with lots of details. And, and sometimes I've actually been shocked when I see what they have been adding because you're cluttering up ECDIS. Too much information, and suddenly there's so much information, so you are forgot, forgetting about safe navigation. And, yep safe navigation that's that's of course priority number one when it comes to ectis yeah i think my my biggest input into that would be let's leave the ectis to drive the ship you know let's not clutter it with all of these this information let's let this do what it's intended for driving the ship and have a, a planning tool back of bridge like one ocean which can provide all of this extra information on environmental areas weather forecasts uh, navigational warnings and so on and let that information sit back of bridge. Um, we're providing that information. We're, we're drawing the shapes once and providing it many times rather than every ship drawing it on their Ectis and potentially getting it incorrect. There's a huge risk there. So yeah, that's the advantage I would see. So if we've used your software to plan the route, I guess you have to retype it into the Ectis somehow or just sort of draw no, it we again. Can export the, we can export the route to ah, okay. Ectis. Yeah, so we've got uh, compatible Ectis transfer with every manufacturer on the market. Okay, so it's just a file of the route that goes across. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So say, for example, you have a Fruno Ectis, simply go into One Ocean, you export the route in Fruno format, take it to the Ectis, and it'll import it. And it works the other way around. You know, you can prepare the route on Fruno Ectis and then bring it into our system, turn on the environmental layer, make sure, you know, make some further adjustments if you feel it's needed based on these different areas that you want to avoid, um, save the route and export it back to the Ectis and you know, let the Ectis follow the route that's been prepared in one ocean. Oh, okay. And, and per this point you made about port state control, I thought that, I mean, I guess shipping people in the audience would be very interested to know anything you're able to share about what you've heard about when you mentioned you, you've heard that port state control have asked companies how you making sure you comply with environmental rules on your next voyage. I don't know if you can give any more detail about well, I, I mean, to follow environmental regulation, it's, it's been a higher, higher priorities and it's been on the agenda everywhere, globally, of course. And, and it comes also into the port state control officers when, when they are going on board the ship, that uh, they see that you are taking the environmental regulations in consideration for the next route. And, and when they're asking the questions, if you don't have environmental, I, I don't even know how to, to answer that question because it, it must... Your two two week road that Tony was demonstrating. I would say that it would take two weeks uh, if you should go through all the <laughs> legal documents that you have to go through and find the environmental regulations for every position, for every area, for every waste stream. And and uh, this is of course uh, one of the reasons why our product are so popular right now. I think. Well, so another question popped in from Siva Sankara Narayan. I think we answered this one. Is it? Would you purchase separately for each ship or do you do a fleet-wide package for the purchasing? Is that for um, Tony, I think? I think, yeah, Pears touched on it, but it's um, it's an annual subscription fee per ship. So if you have tw a 20-ship fleet, then, yeah, you're, you're buying an annual license for each ship in that 20-ship fleet. Okay. And then maybe on the technical stuff, so this last slide you left about the database being accessible through APIs. I mean, I, I, my imagination is going because we, we don't webinars on vessel performance and that's another thing you have to use to plan the voyage with maps about different selfie rules and I guess it all ought to be integrated together. But um, you able to share maybe Tony or what What are you thinking about these APIs? How would they be used? Is that a, or is that all secret so far? Is it? No, I mean, it's something we're planning to introduce in 2022 as it says on the screen. Um, the, the, the idea behind it is, you know, we have this regulatory database within One Ocean. It's very rich, it's very powerful. We have, um, you know, lots of researchers and analysts inputting into it daily, um, updating the, 
the baselines, the shapes, the rules, and so on. And it's currently used by One Ocean platform, as we as we've shown. Um, but the feeling, you know, and the, uh, the the vision here is why why limit ourselves to that? You know, let's open it up to shipping companies to incorporate it into their um, shoreside operating centers, their you know their fleet operating centers. Um, it opens up partnership discussions with um, other partners in the market. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting concept and something yeah we're really looking forward to to discussing with our clients and um, partners early next year. I, I look forward to this, Tony, and I think also, yeah. as you say, the, the, the value of the regulation database that we, we've been gathering information to in the last 10 years and really accelerated in, in the last three years with having so many man years behind it, it's, it's too valuable for the shipping industry for us to just keep it for ourselves. So, I mean, we're opening up this now to, to give access to it, to let our competitors also to use it to provide their customer with this information because it's such a challenge to follow the existing environmental regulation. This challenge is just, just gonna be large and large in the next years to come, I think. Yeah. Oh, another thing I really liked is the is link between the, the space and time. I, I imagine if you're operating a scrubber, you want to know, can I discharge tomorrow? You don't want to know, can I discharge in this part of the sea and you're connecting one with the other, isn't it? So I don't know if there's any, any more thoughts. I mean, I guess you've shown it on the, how it all works with the software, isn't it? But that's something shipping has never had before, being able to see what they're allowed to do in terms of time rather than place, I suppose. Isn't it? That's also something. Yeah, I think it, it, it's, um, yeah. yeah. No, go on, Pat. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, no, no yeah. I mean, I just give, give an example from, from a, a, a partner I had with USA Marine providing food waste system to the shipping industry. They had a problem because um, very nice food waste system, but they had a problem, this holding tank, and the customer uh, was coming into an area where it was forbidden to discharge uh, food waste. And then they realized that the holding tank was full when they were in that area. So, so, so what shall they do? Shall they stop eating in the next 48 hours on board? Uh, or shall they turn around? B because they didn't monitor this. And here you can actually very easily see that, okay, Oh, here it's going to be forbidden. I bet the check here if the holy tank is full or not. And you, it really makes it easy for you to plan and do the right thing at the right time on board, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds so obvious. I suppose every, every company should have it. I, I was thinking there's no road signs at sea. If it was a motorway, there'd be signs saying this is what you can do here and what you can't do here. But on a sea, you can't have road signs, but people should have it on a special computer that tell you what the rules are now, shouldn't they? I think that's a... Yeah, so <laughs> never seen it before, but now you presented it as something I think everybody should have, isn't it? This rules are so hard that uh, how on earth are you going to do it otherwise? <laughs> I, fu I fully agree with you, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sounds great. Well, we're coming up to the end now. There's no more um, questions. I don't know if I'm um, Tony and Per, you'd like to take a couple of minutes each to give some sort of concluding remarks to, to finish. I don't know, maybe Tony first. Do we have a, anything you'd like to leave? Uh, the participants with on the table. table yeah i think you know so um you know for, for me um it's been an evolution since um pair joined the company and you know we've been working on this for a number of years but the actual product itself has been on the market um for three years now it's proven itself and we're installing around 100 ships every month with this environment manager platform um i think it's very clear that the database that we have is the strongest on the market there's nothing like it which is why, as Pear said, why keep it for ourselves? Why just limit it to the platform? Let's widen it up. Let's um, open it up to our partners and our competitors and our customers through a range of APIs. We can bring that information into the, um, the shoreside operating centers. So yeah, it's a fantastic evolution of the product since it started a few years back. So yeah, that's the takeaway. Pear. Yes, um, I mean, for me, it's, um, it's really nice that I've been working with this product for 10 years. I mean, I've, I've been on board ship installing the first uh, uh, system, taking the GPS signal uh, from, from the bridge down in the engine control room, uh, being on board the ship for hours and listen to the customer. That's been, been my leading star in the beginning. Really listen to the captains, really listen to the engine control room engineer. What do they need? How can we develop this product? And that, that's actually is, is shown in the user interface that what you need to know, is it allowed or is it not allowed? Where is it allowed and where is it forbidden? 
to really simplify it so you can use it very practically. And, and uh, so I, I think that we can't take all the credit for, for where the products are today. It's, it's the demand from the customer and that we are providing a solution that they are requesting. And, and uh, that has led to this product that we're having today. Yeah, did I hear you mention a price? Some price? Is it a public price you mentioned or is it all um, on application, the pricing? Is it? It's around 160 US dollars thought... per month per ship for, for, for MR manager uh, in, in the base uh, version. Okay, well, that's great. Well, I think we've seen something totally new we haven't seen before, which uh, now you see it, it looks obvious that you shouldn't, we should have had this before. I think that's what a <laughs> digital ship webinar should be all about. So uh, thanks very much, Kerr and Tony. That's great. And I'll pass back to Farah. Cheers. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. So that's from all, that's all from us from right now. And thank you to our guest speakers, Pierre Usterberg and Tony Brown from One Ocean, and to all our viewers. We'll be sending you the video link soon for recording of this event. We also have another webinar next week on Tuesday, the 7th of December, looking at simulation and prediction, getting beyond performance monitoring with our guests from Navis. You can find out more and sign up at our website, webinars.thedigitalship.com. Goodbye. Well, bye-bye.